want to introduce myself. My name is Devin Stevens. I'm a sales engineer here at Net3 Technology, and we kind of wanted to do a little bit of a live uh, demo, kind of you know answer any questions people might have, that kind of thing. Um, ooh, hold on just a moment. I got. It. Sorry, I was catching my own audio there. <laughs> so now that we got that fixed. Um, so basically, guys, what we want to do today is just kind of run through how Zerto works, um, see if anybody has any kind of questions or, or anything like that that we can answer. Um, so um, without further ado, let's kind of like jump through it. Um, so first off, um, basically, there has to be a little bit of infrastructure that we put in place in order for Zerto to work. So um, what you guys are seeing on my screen right now, this is a typical vCenter uh, implementation. So we have two sides. We have the production side, uh, which consists of, you know, vCenter with physical hosts underneath that, storage underneath that, and then virtual machines that actually live on those hosts. Um, and then on the other side, we have a recovery site. And in this instance, it's built out in exactly the same fashion, right? So it's got vCenter, it's got VMs, it's got hosts and storage, all that kind of good stuff. The big difference between the two is that um, on the backup and recovery side with Zerto, we're really kind of agnostic as, as far as what kind of hypervisor that needs to be. So if you're running vCenter on one side and you're running Hyper, Hyper-V on another, or if you're running vCloud, for instance, with Net3, then, um, we can definitely take those virtual machines and be able to move them between hypervisors, be able to move them uh, and convert them into, into different kind of VM sets. So in order to do that, we've got a little bit of stuff we've got to have in place. So the first thing that we have is Zerto Virtual Manager. And the Zerto Virtual Manager is a pretty simple thing. It's a, it's a Windows machine. It has basically an IIS-based website on it that runs Zerto. Um, this is the management center for uh, your implementation. So you'll have all of your virtual protection groups and your VMs that you're going to protect and, and do failovers and all that kind of stuff that you have to do with Zerto. Um, all of that's going to be done in your ZVM on one or both sides of, of the system. So you have two of them. You've got one that is on-premise and you've got one on your recovery site. And you can utilize either of those to initiate your failovers to do things like that. And that's pretty much what this box does, um, is it's just a management piece. The other portion of its control is it basically deploys these virtual appliances called virtual replication appliances. And these VRAs, these are the workhorses for Zerto. Um, virtual replication appliances are little small hardened Linux appliances um, that get deployed virtually to each host. And they're responsible for doing the actual work. They talk to the hosts, they intercept the data as it's being changed and they compress that, they throttle it and, and kind of provide that replication side. So what happens whenever uh, a virtual machine is being replicated? So basically we have a virtual machine here and it makes a change to a block of data and sends that to storage. We're making a copy of that write command uh, as quickly as possible, and we're sending it over the wire. Um, we don't do any kind of snapshotting. We don't do any kind of um, actual work um, you know, with the, the host itself. We're basically passively monitoring the storage APIs. And then as that block gets changed, we're shrinking it down, compressing it as tightly as possible, and sending across the WAN into the recovery site. So we're really streaming the data um, instead of doing kind of a point in time snapshot. So since we're not doing any snapshots, we're not really affecting production. We're not really you know, hitting very hard on storage IOPS um, or CPU or RAM within the environment. We're just getting that data over as fast as possible. So that allows us to get our RPOs very low uh, because we're sending that data over the stream. Once that data hits on the recovery side, it's actually pushed into what we call um, a, a static disk um, on, on production level storage. So it's a native format virtual disk um, that sits on storage on the recovery side. And then on top of that, we take all of the changes that are being replicated and we create what's called a journal. And then uh, that journal history is what allows us to kind of fail back and forth and, and do certain things. 
Um, the beauty of this process, when we push this down to disk, is that it's actually sitting on production level disk. It's not sitting in capacity backup, you know, cold storage. It's sitting on hot storage. So when it comes time to turn these machines on, we can actually turn them on and have them come up and be ready very quickly um, and uh, get our RTOs actually very, very, uh, very low as well. It also gives us the added benefit of being able to place data where it needs to be. So if you've got SQL servers that are high IOPS and you've got um, other VMs, file servers maybe that don't need really a lot of IOPS, maybe they're more archival storage, you can define uh, in your VPG exactly where you want that data to sit. So when it comes time to fail over that SQL machine and you turn it on, it's sitting on pure flash, right? So it has all the IOPS it needs to be able to take that data and, and run it as best as possible. Um, so without further ado, let's kind of look at um, what Zerto actually looks like. Um, so what you're seeing on my screen here, this is the ZVM, the Zerto Virtual Manager. Um, this is the user interface in which we actually <clears throat> do most of our work with Zerto. This is where we configure things. This is where we do failovers, um, all that kind of good stuff. Um, this dashboard that you're seeing in front of you is just kind of a state of the union. This is basically showing you, um, I have six virtual protection groups. Uh, virtual protection groups at their core are just a group of machines um, that all need to work together. The way that I like to configure my Zerto uh, protection groups is by application. So if I have, say, a application that contains a component of a SQL backend and has a web front end, I want both of those servers within the same uh, virtual protection group. And what Zerto will do is take those two servers and anytime it makes a checkpoint for the SQL backend or the, or the web front end, it will make a corresponding checkpoint down to the second for that other server um, that's within that protection group. And, and protection groups can have as many VMs in them as you want. So if you have very large sets of VMs that make up your applications, you can take those and you can, and you can utilize them within the VPG. And what that does for you is when you fail over, you can fail all of those machines over to the exact same point in time. Uh, so it allows you to get consistency across your data uh, within that application. Um, <clears throat> so I have six VPGs here. Um, they each have a single VM in them. So I've got six virtual machines. I'm protecting about 342 gigs of data across those six VMs. Now, notice my compression ratio is around 95% here. Um, if I come and look at these graphs, these are graphs of the IOPS that are actually occurring in my environment. And then the throughput in megabytes per second that are actually being pushed across the WAN. Now, notice my throughput here is about 1.5 megabytes per second. But if I look at my WAN traffic, it's much, much lower. So we're only doing like 0.07. That's because we're compressing as much as we can of this data. So basically, this is the amount of data that would have to be transmitted. Once compressed, this is how much we actually transmit. And this allows us to kind of save some resources on bandwidth, things like that, which also allows us to get our average RPO down much further. So in this case, across my six VPGs, I have an RPO that averages about seven seconds right now. That means that I could unplug these servers, um, have a meteor strike my data center, and I'm only losing about seven seconds of data um, out of there. So pretty cool. Um, now I have you know, six VPGs. I can look at VPG help here. If I've got one that's in trouble, I can visually see, you know, hey, I've got a, something I need to look into, into here. I can actually click on that and see what's going on. So I have a site disconnect between these two um, sites right here. And that kind of gives me the idea of, hey, what's going on within this environment? Now, if I want to get a more in-depth look at a VPG, I can do so. So if I click on my VPGs tab here, this shows me all of my virtual protection groups. And if I go and click in one, I can see the same data that I'm looking at on the main screen, on the main dashboard within the VPG specifically. So I can see the RPO over time. I can see the amount of IOPS. I can see the throughput, the WAN traffic that's being generated. And then I also have this nice little doohickey here called journal history. And journal history, we can treat like retention for your backups almost. Journal history is um, basically how long we have checkpoints going back for. You wanna keep this as long as you can. 
right? We can utilize a checkpoint or journal history of up to 30 days, um, which gives you plenty of time to realize that something's gone wrong and be able to um, go back from that and, and be, able to, uh, be able to recover properly. Building these VPGs out, super simple. Um, we basically come in, we give it a name, we set the priority on the VPGs. Um, you choose the VMs that you want to be in there. And then you can go in and say, okay, I want certain kinds of storage uh, on this guy. So maybe this is a SQL server. I need this on gold storage rather than, uh, rather than on thin or on silver storage. I can also specify how my network cards are set up. So if I go in and edit this guy, um, I can define during a failover how I want my machines to come online. Do I want the IP addresses to change? Do I want uh, you know, to get DHCP? Do I want to put in manual IPs? Um, and what are those IPs that I want? And what network it's going to attach to? Now, notice I have two networks here. I have a failover move scenario and a test scenario. Testing is done on what we call bubble networks or isolated networks within the recovery side. So in our data centers, um, we'll have basically networks defined um, that either mimic yours or, or not, depending on how we're connected um, networking wise. If we're connected over layer three, you know, we have to have different um, IP ranges on both sides. If we're connected via layer two, then we can have um, the same subnets on both sides. But either way, we're gonna define a set of networks. And I'll show you that here in just a moment when we look at the recovery side. Um, but, what we're gonna do in a test scenario is we're actually gonna isolate this network from your production. And we're gonna isolate this network from the internet. And then we can do a failover into this bubble network and not interrupt your production, not send bad data out to the internet. So that means that tests now go from a downtime incurring event in which you've gotta you know, manage to communicate with your end users that, hey, we're gonna be down during this time. And, so on and so forth, and things could things could happen. We're going to be failing over servers, so um, you know you got to send out communication. Then your boss calls you and says you're not doing that during the day. You have to do that on the weekends. So now your weekend shot. So we're not going to do that with Zerto. Uh, Zerto it gives you the ability to test during the day, so you can bring your machines online. You can test whether your applications can talk to your SQL databases. You can log into servers, make sure the Active Directory is working, and. Um, all that kind of good stuff that we need to do during a failover, <clears throat> you can do that during a test scenario. It's the exact same implementation and exact same process as a real failover. It's just going into a bubble, uh, bubble network. So once we've got our network cards set up and we have our test scenarios, we have our actual production or failover scenarios, then we're good to go. So we can go ahead and look at our summary, make sure that this is exactly what we want to see and uh, click done and we're off to the races, we're good to go. So that being said, let's do a failover. So when I click failover, I've got two options here, test and live. Um, test is that bubble network, right? That we're gonna bring things up into. Live is, this is connected to my production. I'm gonna be able to talk to these machines. They're gonna be able to talk to the internet, all that kind of good stuff. We're gonna do a live failover. Um, we'll actually do two. So we're gonna do one to Las Vegas and one to um, our Spartanburg site. So those are our two data centers that are uh, currently taking Zerto right now. Um, Atlanta will be coming online uh, here anytime now. And we're pretty excited about that. <clears throat> so um, I've got these two guys. If I wanted to choose just a single virtual machine, I could. Um, I could actually click into this, choose a single VM that I want to recover or fail over and go ahead and do that. Um, I'm gonna choose a checkpoint for these guys. Notice I've got about 1,400 checkpoints that I can go back to. They're about every five seconds apart. Um, that's the beauty of that streaming technology behind Zerto is that we can get checkpoints that have very, very, um, very close together. All right, so um, I'm going to go ahead and choose the latest checkpoint for this guy. And maybe on this guy, let's go back a little bit. Let's pull him from, let's say, 1016 today. We'll get very granular with this kind of stuff. The other beauty that we have here is because of the nature of the failover, which is we can bring machines online from production storage. Um, the journal history is stored on production storage. We can actually bring the machines online and then have the ability to roll them back and roll back the failover that we just went through. Um, so that's what I'm gonna do with one of these guys. So with this guy, I'm gonna do an auto rollback. 
and I'm going to put in like, let's say a 30 minute window. And what Zerto is going to do is it's going to go ahead and it's going to do the failover. It's going to bring the machine online within the data center. And then it's going to set a timer for 30 minutes. And after the end of that 30 minutes, it's automatically going to roll back that failover if I don't tell it to go ahead and commit. Now, at any time, I can come in and say, okay, commit this. This is good to go, right? But this kind of takes it out of my hands. Um, if, if this failover goes through um, and I want it to roll back, I don't have to do anything, or I can go ahead and initiate that rollback. Auto commits are exactly the opposite. If I set an auto commit for 30 minutes, basically this is going to, Zerto is going to fail the machine over, and then it's going to go in that wait mode. And if I haven't told it within that 30 minutes to roll that back, then it's going to go ahead and, and commit that. Um, I'm going to go ahead and commit this one. So I'm going to set a zero minute time or zero minute timeout here. And that gives me an, a, just an immediate commit on that machine. These machines are running in production right now. They are live. So I'm going to go ahead and shut them down. <clears throat> and then I'm going to do a very important thing. I'm going to reverse protect um, all of these machines. Oh, sorry about that. It's not going to let me reverse protect on an auto rollback. Um, on an auto commit, it will. Be. So everything's reverse protected. Um, reverse protection basically means that once they fail over, um, those machines are going to be online in the data center and your users are going to be making changes to them in their failed over state um, within our systems. Um, at that point, Zerto on our side is going to start looking for your Zerto implementation to come back online. So say your power went out, it's been out for a day, and then all of a sudden it comes back online, your Zerto machines are back up, everything's good to go. What happens then is Zerto begins replicating the change <clears throat> that has happened in the failover site back to the on-prem site. And then once it has made that, all those changes, got everything synced back up, you can fail back out of the system the same way that you can fail in it. So it's a, it's a pretty cool way to get back out of the data center. No offloading it to disk and then shipping it to you, all that kind of stuff. You get back out the same way you got in. So once we've got everything set, we go ahead and start the failover. And we'll kick that off. We should see a couple of tasks uh, running right here. All right, they have begun. All right, while that's happening, let's go ahead and we'll log into uh, B Center on our side and show you exactly what this looks like. So we've made quite a bit of progress already. This is a pretty quick um, endeavor that we're doing here. We want to have nice, fast RTOs. All right, it took me a little bit to log in there. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about what Net3 provides um, in terms of Zerto, because Zerto software, you can buy that for on-prem, you know, replicate to your own DR facilities, all that kind of good stuff. But what we provide um, is an actual custom-built virtual data center um, that you control. Um, so we run all of the infrastructure behind it. You don't have to worry about updating hardware, updating firmware on that infrastructure, um, you know, taking care of circuits and paying those bills for the circuits, all that kind of good stuff. We can do all that for you. And then when you log into our systems, what you get is a vCloud tenant. Um, so this is a virtual tenant that's available to you. And you can utilize this for all of your failover, disaster recovery, backup, production needs that you have. Um, so these two data centers here, this is my on-demand data center. This machine right here, this BRS spa, this is the machine that we are currently failing over. Notice he's turned off right now. 
he doesn't have um, kind of anything going on with them um, as far as like VMware tools or IP addresses, that kind of thing. Um, as we go through this process, that machine will be, you know, add VMware tools, he will power on, he'll, he'll become a fully filled over machine. <clears throat> now, once this is failed over, you have access to them in your environment, just like you would, you know, something within your VMware cluster. You can do things like change the storage policies related to them, which initiates VMware uh, vMotion, storage vMotions on the back end. You can change up the hardware architecture. So if you need more cores or you need more sockets, depending on what your application is, you can define exactly how these are built out. The amount of memory, uh, whether you can hot add virtual CPUs and, and, and memory to them, you can add and remove hard drives out here, adjust the bus numbers, adjust the bus types that are attached to them. You can configure the, the network cards that are attached to it. Um, so you can find, hey, I want to attach this to this network um, and maybe get an IP mode from DHCP. Um, you have full control at the virtual machine level to these, to these failed over machines. You also have full control over the network. So if you want to come in and create either isolated testing networks or routed networks, you can do so. Routed networks go out and they actually attach to something that we would call you know, your perimeter, your edge gateway. Um, edge gateways are um, basically for the ones that we provide are VMware native NSX edge devices that are fully featured firewalls. They have the capability of you know, inputting firewall rules, you can do NAT, you can do routing, you can do uh, VPN, IPsec VPNs on these guys. Uh, it's a fully featured firewall that's able to connect into your infrastructure. Now, coming with our Atlanta data center, we're going to be running uh, basically a bring your own appliance. So you'll be able to <clears throat> bring in that virtual you know, Cisco ASA or Fortinet device or Barracuda device, whatever that virtual appliance is that fully meshes in with your network, you'll be able to run those. Um, so in that case, you're kind of utilizing those things that you already utilize within our data center and it gives you full control over all of that. So it's a, it's a pretty cool way to be able to address um, the data center. You don't need to have your own colo, you don't need to have your own racks, you don't need to have your own networking or infrastructure. Everything can run within us. And kind of the great thing about it is we're a production service and that's, that's kind of our orientation is we run production workloads 24 seven, 365 for our customers. So what you're taking advantage of in a disaster recovery as a service situation is the ability to have your machines brought online within a data center that is production capable. Um, so if you have a need for high IOPS, we have the storage to be able to run high IOPS. Um, we run you know, data analytics processes on our stuff, uh, Vertex, things like that, that, that basically are Vertica rather, not Vertex, that basically are extremely high IO um, sensitive applications. So if you need that kind of level of storage, that's something we can provide. If you need, you know, cold glacial S3 kind of storage, that's something that we can provide in our data centers too. We're fully production ready. So that gives you guys um, kind of the option. So this is this machine that we just failed over. Um, we can get a console to him. We can log into him. He's available to my end users um, at this point in time. If we go back into Zerto, we can see that that failover is waiting for user input. And then we're almost done with the commit on this failover. So commits basically saying that's a permanent failover at that point. And if we go look at our VPGs, you can see the difference. So this one's currently still committing and promoting. This one is done. This is the one that we just looked at. And it gives me two options here. I can roll back, which basically ends this failover, puts it right back the way it was, or I can go ahead and commit this at this point. At the end of that 30 minutes, it's going to go ahead and commit and fail it in. But we're going to roll it back and get it back on prem. So you should see that rolling back failover kind of kicking in. So once this roll this uh, rollback is done, we'll actually be able to go in and pick another failover point and then utilize that to do our failover. This is pretty handy if, say, you've got <clears throat> a virus or ransomware is on a machine. And you need to be able to basically bring the machines up and online, check them for ransomware, make sure that they're good and clean. Um, and then if they aren't, go ahead and roll back those things and be able to choose another checkpoint and fill it in. 
Um, that's really handy for that um, kind of process there. So kind of some cherry on top um, before we kind of get into questions. Um, there's a couple of things that we get asked in a DRAS conversation about a lot. Um, DRAS is one of those things that is becoming more and more popular because number one, cybersecurity insurance guys are, are demanding that there be some sort of disaster recovery as a service uh, in play, um, as well as, you know, just IT guys like ourselves just you know, needing a better mechanism um, for being able to provide uptime uh, for our end users during a, during a disaster event. Both of those things are kind of regulated and have a lot of compliances that are, that are built around. And, you know, if you're getting audited, the, one of the main things that they're going to ask for is going to be a report showing your last DR test or your last recovery. Um, Zerto makes that so easy. Um, we actually have a report type it's called recovery reports, and you can sort out exactly how long you want to get that information for. So if I want to go back to 2020, you know, I can go back for an entire year and get all of my, um, my failovers for the entire year. So if I go look at one of these guys, actually, let's not do that. Let's just do today. Let's look at the failovers we actually just did. So this is the um, East Coast failover that we just did and like that. Um, so we can see some basic information here and be able to kind of see exactly, you know, how long it took and all that kind of good stuff. But if we want to have a report that we can give to an auditor, we can just export the PDF for this guy. And then we have the entire report for everything. So we can see it was initiated by me. We can see the point in time. We can see the recovery start time and the end time. That entire RP, RTO for that machine was three minutes and 22 seconds. That's how long it took from the time that I hit go until the time that it was available in vCloud and the actual failover was done. So um, we can put in notes on tests and be able to have notes that show up here. Um, and then Zerto kind of details out exactly what it did during that process of failover. Um, and then at the end, we get a place that we can sign off and put this in a book or, or hand it off to an auditor. And they love this kind of stuff, right? This is it pretty much spells out everything that an auditor needs to be able to give you a good green check mark in the, in the DR scenarios. Um, the other kind of uh, thing that we can do that we, is pretty awesome is we can actually restore files as well. And this is a secondary um, thing for Zerto. Basically, what this allows me to do is say, I wanna select this machine, and then I can utilize the same checkpoints at those 1500 checkpoints to be able to mount this disk in the cloud. So if I have, say I'm doing backup uh, for once a day, right? And that happens at midnight every day, I do a backup of my machines. And then I have a <clears throat> end user that comes in at eight o'clock in the morning. He creates a bunch of data out there, um, creates a lot of, of files, you know, for accounting or something like that. Maybe it's a month end. And then at three o'clock that afternoon, four o'clock that afternoon, we get hit with ransomware. Um, those, that data that that user created since last night, it's gone, right? Um, now I could fail over the entire machine, but maybe I was able to contain everything. It was just one file share. And I really don't want to fail over the entire machine to be able to get that file share back. Um, Zerto gives us the option of coming in and actually browsing the disk from cloud, choosing the file structure that we want to um, recover here. And let's say I want my contacts, my desktop, downloads, documents. And then Zerto is gonna zip this up and it's gonna allow us to download that. And these are the same checkpoints that we utilize for actual failover. So that means that, you know, I've got within five seconds of us creating that, I've got data that I can go back and give back to my user, right? So it's a nice little, nice little thing that we can do with files um, around the system. And that kind of wraps us 